finite element analysts need to know a little about convergence because this is a process where you improve the model and then get better and better answers. Sometimes convergence is based on concepts dealing with the mesh size, or sometimes it's done with the refinement of the polynomial degree. Finally, you can also improve the quality of the mesh as time goes on in your modeling process. So through some combination of these refinement ideas, you arrive at a model that's suitably accurate for your needs. I'm going to start out with some convergence concepts. These are simple ideas about how models are improved. And then I'd like to use a small industrial case study on a jet engine where a group had to do their own simple convergence tests. And then we'll end up with several problems. Years ago in mathematics classes, I was interested in the idea of convergence of series. And here you found that there were two ways to look at it. One way was to think in terms of what was called Cauchy convergence, and that had to do with looking at the change between successive terms in a sequence or as they were summed up into a series. For instance, your um, baseline value might be this lower left point, and then some refined model in some way, perhaps judging by the number of degrees of freedom in the model, might move you to this second point on a quantity such as stress strain, displacement on the um, ordinate here. And the difference between your current value and the previous value would be reflected by this bracketed quantity here. And that then, as you track it from refinement to refinement, going to this third point would give you this small bracketed quantity. And then lastly, this would give you this sm very small amount. And by comparing the change of those quantities, which are, um, they're not quite errors in a sense. They're just changes from the last solution to the current one. You get some impression of convergence. And Cauchy gave some rules under which you could prove that that um, sequence of numbers would converge to a finite number. But what would be better if you were able to do it would be able to compare your current answer, say this baseline, with some absolute value that you know to be the correct value. Then as you progress along here, you generate these uh, blue-based uh, uh, quantities. And here's another blue base that's a little smaller, and then finally a smaller one. And that would be called absolute convergence. And there are some rules on that for convergence also that you can find in the um, um, elementary textbooks. So whether you could get absolute convergence or Cauchy depends on your situation. But unfortunately, most of us in the finite element world really deal with what you might call Cauchy convergence, where we want to do several refinements in our model and then observe the change in the answer as we move along. If the system is really complicated, we're not going to know the absolute value, and we can't use absolute arguments. Remember, uh, Cauchy sequences, for instance, if the numbers um, are changing by 1 over, let's say, n, and that might be some residual uh, quantity here of, of the change each time, then that doesn't converge. On the other hand, if the terms vary as 1 over n squared, then you do get convergence. So those are rough um, concepts. The convergence ideas that we're working with here depend on looking at a sequence of finite element models and then making a better and better model. Now, this isn't really done in practice very often. It's usually done at the beginning of some product analysis where, whether it's a wheel or an airplane wing, the analyst will determine what mesh quality is needed to get a reasonable answer. But after that, generally as subsequent analyses are done, they're done with that convergence quality built into their thinking and influencing the mesh size and the degree of the polynomials and the quality of the mesh. So 
what I'm getting at is that in industrial practice, you can only afford typically to do one mesh of a body. And you'll redo it if you're in trouble. But it's good to have some preconceived notion of what the convergence properties of your system are so that you can go right away to a mesh that will give you your 5% accuracy or whatever is desired. Now, in our academic study of this um, convergence, we're going to talk first about the mesh refinement, and we'll talk about the H being the average size of the element. P will be the polynomial degree of the displacement field in the elements. And it's been shown that the displacement field in your solution has error of the order of the element size raised to the polynomial degree plus one. Right away you see that probably the polynomial degree is more important than the element size because of the power of an exponent. Now this large O here means that the error is proportional to this quantity H to the P plus one. And that means that in the limit, as you go to small mesh size, let's say, uh, that the error divided by the H to the power P plus one will go to some constant value. And that therefore there's some sort of a bounding of the error that's involved. Now, when you talk about a specific case, let's say the Turner Triangle, where you have a linear displacement field, then the error in the displacement field is of the order of the element size raised to the power 2, because P, the polynomial is 1, and then you add 1. And you look at that and you say, well, that looks pretty good, because if I cut the mesh spacing in a, a by a factor of 2, then I'll reduce the error by a factor of 4. In other words, it goes like the square of the mesh size. That's still not quite as good as you might think because having the element size will create four times as many elements in a given domain because it's a two-dimensional problem. So you really are barely keeping up with the error. You really do four times as much work to get four times the accuracy. Unfortunately, that's not all the story for the Turner Triangle. Although you get reasonable accuracy results on displacements, if you look at stresses, things get worse. Let's go to the general case, first of all, to elastic elements that have stresses that are first derivatives of displacement, and that would include the Turner Triangle. Then the derivative knocks down the accuracy and your error in stress goes to the order of the um, element size to the power p. So we've lost the unit value in the exponent. And then if you go to structural elements which have two derivatives involved in the strain displacement law, you find that the error in stress goes as the order of h to the p minus 1. That looks bad, maybe even hopeless, but it turns out that structural elements use higher degree polynomials, so there's some compensation. Now if we look seriously at the Turner Triangle, ask about the convergence on stress, we see that it goes as the order of the mesh size h. Now that's unfortunate because in a two-dimensional problem, if you have the mesh size, that takes you four times as much work and you only get twice the accuracy. So you're on the losing end of things there. And then if we look at an example of a structural element such as the simple Euler-Bernoulli beam, you would find that that's a cubic polynomial in the interpolating function. And then there are two derivatives that knock the error and stress to be of order h squared. Now for a one-dimensional beam structure, a rod or a pole or something, this is good because you then would have the mesh size and you'd get uh, four times the accuracy, or another way to say it is one quarter the error. But in two dimensions, it becomes a wash, and in three dimensions, you start losing because then you need um, perhaps eight times as many elements to get um, four times the accuracy.
I've done a small study on convergence using a tapered line element. And this is meant to play off the H and the P convergence. Here I show this single tapered line element and the area ratio is shown down in the lower right corner. It's varying linearly, but uh, this means that the diameter of the element is varying as a square root with distance along the x-axis. Then I take two such elements using the same end-to-end -end area ratio of two and equally divide, and in this case use linear elements. Here I take three linear elements, four and five. So basically this is an H convergence in the horizontal direction. Then in the vertical direction, as we move here, I go from a two-noted to a three-noted element so that I use a quadratic function for the interpolation polynomial, then a cubic, a quartic, and a quintic. And so we're getting basically a P convergence as we go downward. Then these intermediate pieces in here are all hybrid types of convergence. There really would be two ways to do this set of solutions. In, in both cases, I'd like to compare with the exact solution, which is logarithmic, and uh, in which one accounts for the taper of the element in the integration of strain energy. So uh, the two approaches would be to either account for the taper directly in the integration of strain energy or to assume it's a constant area element in each case. But I've decided to concentrate now on the role of the polynomial and the role of the number of elements. So uh, I've decided to integrate exactly in regard to the area distribution. So that won't be a third contributing factor here. And when we get done, we'll compare the three noted elements, whether it be two linear elements or one quadratic element. Then we can also compare uh, the four noted versions, and we can compare the five noted versions. Now there's an intermediate case here, a hybrid element with five nodes also. Let's look at the results of our convergence study. For the baseline element here, a single two-noted element, our answer is 4% high. Then as we move along this axis to the right with more elements, two elements give us only 1% error, three elements give us some half a percent, and four elements a quarter of a percent. Now there's an improvement there of somewhere between a factor of two and four per addition of a degree of freedom. Now that's going to turn out to be modest compared with the P convergence down the vertical axis because here as we go from the linear element to a quadratic element we have only 0.121% error and that's an improvement of some factor of 30. Here again as we go to a cubic element, the improvement is, is dramatic again, perhaps another factor of 30. And lastly, the last one that we've done calculations for um, with a quartic, we again get that same ratio of about 30 in improvement and converge very quickly. Michael Dunn then has helped me with these calculations. Now, I did an intermediate calculation here for the two element with two parabolic um, interpolation polynomials, and that also had uh, a nice result. One thing you can do is to compare the, um, the two accuracies at a constant number of degrees of freedom. For instance, we could compare this three degree of freedom model with this one here to see that the P convergence is indeed looking better. We can compare this four degree of freedom problem here with this four degree of freedom. And then lastly, there are five degree of freedom solutions here that I'll roughly outline. I'm not being very accurate on these drawings. So, nice little problem to see the uh, trade-off between P and H convergence.
Now, you can see from it, however, that there's going to be more and more interest in P-convergent finite element programs because of the power. The um, downside on that is that it's more difficult to develop the elements, and um, so there will be a, a certain amount of element development needed, and then extending into nonlinear regions often is tougher as you go to higher and higher polynomials. I've turned our lab problem number one into a convergence study by using refined mesh. Here I've used quad eights and then in increasing refinement until I reach something close to the exact value, 391 megapascals. Remember that the um, classical value for a doubly infinite plate with a hole in it uh, was a factor of th three at the top and minus one at the side of the hole and the minus one would have been uh, in compression. So these numbers are substantially higher than the doubly infinite body, and it shows how the stress has to flow through those narrowed regions, and you get an increased stress concentration factor that way. Now, the quad eight element in MSC Nastran gives you corner or nodal values, and so we're looking at the stress in the proper site and so this is basically a, a mesh refinement, a, a study of the H convergence. A second study for that uh, lab problem number one was done with quad four elements. Now Mike Eldred helped me with these calculations. And here the quad four has a problem in that it basically gives centroidal stresses. That's its most accurate stress. And I didn't try to get grid point stresses on it. I just used a refined mesh um, so that the solution that we're getting here is showing not only the effect of the H refinement, but also the positioning of the point in question. And uh, we're getting a convergence toward the proper point at the same time we're converging with smaller elements. Now, this set of numbers converges monotonically from below, and maybe partially because of that position error that I've mentioned. We don't quite reach as high a stress as the quad eight did, even with our finest refinement. And I think I would attribute most of that to the uh, difference in the position that's being measured. Now between this figure and the previous one, you can also do something like a cross plot and get a little bit of a concept of P convergence. We lack a true absolute correct value, so it would be a little difficult to, to draw the complete conclusions from this study, but I think there's some nice indications here. Most of the comments that we can make about the preceding two figures would have to be considering convergence in the Cauchy sense. That is, how does each of the refinements differ from the previous one? Because we do lack that absolute number for the precise answer. Now, let's go on to some convergence criteria that have been known for some years. And these are given somewhat heuristically, but are so logical and everyone agrees to their uh, validity and importance that uh, I guess I won't quibble about mathematics. The first is that the, uh, in order to get convergence to the correct answer, uh, you need to have displacement functions that allow rigid body modes. And I show here the original body in black and then the deformed body in red. Notice that it's a large translation. And of course, that is exaggerating the infinitesimal types of translation that we're interested in in this course. Likewise here, this large rotation is, is quite an exaggeration as well. But your assumed displacement field has to allow this. And if you don't, you're going to get in trouble. Secondly, if you uh, pick displacement polynomials, you have to have those that allow constant straining modes. And that would mean that you could perhaps take this body and stretch it, as I've shown here, where the original black square goes into the red rectangle. 
Um, this would be a sort of a uniaxial type of uh, extension. Over here, though, there's a biaxial type or a dilatation where the square goes into a larger square. Now, that would have constant strain both in the, say, the x and y directions. And then thirdly, you like only to have finite strains at the inter-element boundaries. This is a displacement compatibility or sometimes what's called a conforming element. And it, it isn't just that the nodes are kept in contact, but all the material on the element edge is kept in contact. So you cannot get a hole opening up, as I have just suggested there. So these are convergence criteria. The first two, in some sense, are the same as a Fourier analysis, where you're asked to keep the long wavelength terms. You know, you, you wouldn't um, lightly skip terms in a Fourier series unless you had reason to, because long wavelength information is often dominant in physical processes. So see here, these constant translations across the face of the body, or the, perhaps in this case, the rigid rotation involves linear um, displacement fields. Uh, this is important. These are long wavelength things. Then you come next to the, uh, the linear straining terms that you need to carry. And then it turns out you do not need the higher ones for convergence. You do need these first two sets of terms, and they capture what you could roughly call the long wavelength behavior of the displacement field. Now, the third one is a little trickier. It's more of an energy argument that you don't want to lose energy at the inner element boundaries by having a hole open up or overlapping material. The monotonic convergence that we noticed in the quad four study for the lab problem one turned out to be somewhat accidental in that problem, but you can guarantee that under certain conditions. Malash was the um, first discoverer of this concept, and he stated conditions for guaranteeing monotonic convergence. If your elements satisfy those conditions of conformability, and that is displacement compatibility, uh, and if a sequence of solutions is made with nested grids, that means the, the um, subsequent grid patterns carry all the previous boundaries, so you're only adding degrees of freedom, adding new degrees of freedom. You're not losing old degrees of freedom. And then if you use a potential energy formulation, then you're guaranteed to converge monotonically from below on displacements, strains, stresses, and strain energy. And in other words, the model is too stiff, which is similar to the potential energy theorem and as it's carried out in the Rayleigh-Ritz method. So if you are a very formal developer of finite elements and you follow these rules, then you will guarantee that the element is too stiff and that your stresses are too low. Now, an unfortunate thing is that that's not conservative from a design standpoint because you rather would have stresses estimated too high to give you some warning, you know, a little more caution built in. But nevertheless, people have learned to deal with this. It, it is a general disadvantage of the displacement method in finite elements, however, which is basically built on virtual work and potential energy ideas. There is a need for a more practical test of whether elements are going to converge or not, and one was produced by Bruce Irons called the patch test. Um, the preceding conditions by Malash that we just discussed are considered sufficient, and that means that they're more severe than really necessary. Now we're going to get into conditions that are, that are more relaxed, not quite as severe. And in fact, you can find that you can show convergence of non-conforming elements that means even those that have holes or overlapping at inner element boundaries. Now, here's Irons' patch test. If 
you create an arbitrarily shaped patch of elements and you have at least one internal node and if you impose displacements on that outer boundary that are consistent with a constant strain field and if you get the correct stresses out of this element in this patch element by element then the element will converge to the correct answer now this is not a mathematical proof here we're just stating the result and um, it's really a practical test because people can do this numerically and having in their hand a new proposed finite element a person can build this small patch of elements and see whether the element passes the test here's a typical patch I show a triangular element uh, pattern here with five elements and a single internal node. And then if you impose displacements around the periphery that are consistent, say, with a uniform epsilon x, so this is a constant strain in the x direction, which would strain the body as shown at the right, then you would check the stresses you get in the element for the given material properties and if they're exact then you've got a good converging element physically the rationale is that there is no energy lost at the inner element boundaries therefore the energy of the uh, imposed displacement field has to go into the internal strain energy in the body and therefore if your internal element model is consistent uh, you shouldn't have any lost energy anywhere an interesting thing is that if you go to smaller and smaller elements and then you can show that the patch test is both necessary and sufficient so um, it's a uh, mathematically a precise um, measure then of convergence and you must know about the patch test i was at a national meeting once where there was an older gentleman at an aerospace engineering national convention and he had developed an element and he presented at the board through a half hour discussion and it was a rather intricate element that was in some ways um, uh, controversial and as he tried to defend his element during the discussion period one of the first questions was does your element pass the patch test and he didn't even know what the patch test was and I could see the whole audience kind of sag back and start reading their programs and they really didn't pay any attention further to what he had to say and I felt kind of bad about that because he'd done a good job but no one had ever talked to him about convergence ideas and, and the importance of, of um, proving your element's um, quality in this way. A young man who got his PhD at the University of Michigan several years ago was Bob Sandstrom in naval architecture. And I asked Bob to give a talk at one of my summer conferences. He had a handful of slides, and one of them was the one shown here with the two meters. And I looked at that, and I thought, oh, boy, what's this? After the conference and the evaluations, one of the attendees said this was the best slide of the whole conference, and why didn't we have more like this that really explained things clearly? And uh, it's really true. He, his effort meter and his accuracy meter, the whole goal in finite elements is to have your effort meter down at a pretty low value and your accuracy meter pretty high. And so I guess Bob really got the idea through. So I laughed about that, and Bob gave me permission to use his meters in my discussions after that. Another graduate student who took my finite element classes live uh, was Leisha Peterson, and she said, Professor Anderson, would you like a convergence study that we did uh, some time ago at General Electric? And I said, sure, get permission and bring it in. And she brought it in, and there's nothing very controversial here at all. Um, it was a study of a compressor of a jet engine. And this has to do primarily with the hub area, and there would also be blades, of course, that would go along with this. 
here are uh, several stages of a compressor. The um, axis of rotation would be down below here. These spin, and these are like hollow disks as they're shown. They found that um, these um, compressor stages could be isolated, and it was done actually mechanically by these flexible arms that are pretension in a way to cause a certain force between the different stages. Ap apparently, this is like a dust cover, this, um, this uh, sheet metal-like structure here, and then these are like clasping hands here where they overlap and they're tensioned to maintain the tightness of that seal. Well, they decided to uh, isolate one stage of the compressor by this dashed line and then to use a forced boundary condition on the broken uh, edge of that system. So the stage was isolated and this axisymmetric model was built. And Still, it was too big for the kind of problem they were envisioning. They were going to optimize the shape of this structure, and they wanted to run a problem over and over, so they wanted fewer degrees of freedom. So the second windowing in or zooming in was done with this dashed line, and here they put displacement boundary conditions on the cut edge. So that's kind of a nice trick then to see how you can uh, proceed from a larger model to a smaller one by isolating, much as a free body diagram, the region of interest. And then you have to apply either the set of displacements or the set of forces on those cut edges. Three models were made of that final zoomed-in area, and they were at different densities. Density number one shown here is the coarsest, two is the middle, and three is the finest. Now these are not nested mesh in the sense that Malash thought of, because these do not uh, replicate in the following figure. In other words, we don't just subdivide case one to get case two, but rather there are new boundaries developed here that, uh, and old ones are lost. So um, we aren't guaranteed of the convergence in a monotonic way. Also, the element that was used was not necessarily a compatible and um, fully potential energy generated element. So we won't get the monotonic convergence that we had expected from Mosh's ideas. This particular analysis group had their own in-house finite element code that they used a lot uh, for their own work. And they like to make their models with that code called A fine slash mass. Now, this had to do with axisymmetry cases. So um, they identified the high stress regions in their problem with that particular code, and those are marked here. Then we'll look at the stresses at those points in the next table. I'll show you the stresses at those five critical points. We're interested in these three local studies with the coarse, intermediate, and finer mesh density. There's also a global solution and then the one with this reference code. The stresses that we're interested in actually here descend monotonically as well as here. Um, here they're um, ascending monotonically. And so this is what we would have expected from a model that was too stiff. So there's a mixture here, and it's clear that this finite element family that it was used does not satisfy Malash's criteria for monotonic convergence. And that's quite common because uh, you can have non-conforming elements, for one thing. Secondly, when you go into numerically integrated elements, sometimes there are numerical approximations that uh, will take you away from that potential energy uh, formulation initially. The objective of this study was to find a mesh refinement that would be efficient for doing many, many optimization studies. And so we have to compare the accuracies and the cost of these 
different local solutions. If I call the course mesh the reference and give it um, a zero as its uh, percentage change, then the medium solution was 7% more accurate, and then the fine solution added 2% more in the accuracy. And in each case, it roughly doubled the cost to move to those finer meshes. So an engineering and a business decision was made that the optimization would be done at this intermediate level of accuracy because it wasn't worth spending the extra money to get that last 2% of accuracy. Indeed, then, you could do a fine mesh at the very end as a final proof of your design. Problem number one is a question I asked in the preliminary exam for our PhD candidates just last term. Um, I propose that there would be a hypothetical element with three degrees of freedom as shown. And this was a triangle. It was an equilateral triangle. And each of the nodes could slide in and out along the lines shown. And this was a three degree of freedom triangle. So I asked the students, is this a useful element for general use? And discuss its good and bad features. And then use some of the commonly applied criteria to evaluate this element. As a plain stress triangle, this element is pretty bad. First of all, it would have trouble in connecting with the neighbors. Notice when I have two adjacent triangular elements such as this, that uh, at a common node, one triangle can only move vertically at that node and the other at this angle here. That would effectively lock up the combined node because of the infinite stiffness in the other directions. It's a little bit of an unusual thing to have to consider such a uh, nodal connection because it's very rare that you restrict your degrees of freedom like that. Uh, another general feature is that with only three degrees of freedom, you could represent three different kinds of displacement field. One of them we've identified already would be where the three nodes moved equally outward, and that would be called dilatation. Then you could have combinations where one moved inward and the other two 